four, three, two, one. Hello and welcome. My name is Stephen Haney and I'm the branch manager of the South Eagle Venhurst branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library System. I am thrilled that you chose to spend your evening with us for a vital conversation with Heather McGee, author of The Some of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. This event is part of CCPL and WKYC's Community Read. For additional content, please see the link just posted in the chat box as WKYC dedicated a special episode of its A Turning Point series early this year to the some of us, explaining zero-sum thinking and digging into some of the Northeast Ohio observations McGee covered in the book. If you would like to order your own copy of The Some of Us from Max Bax on Coventry, follow the Max Bax link in the chat. I also invite you to check out a copy physically or virtually from your local library branch. I just want to let you know, uh, before I go any further, I'm going to pop back in around 8.15, uh, where you can, where I'll talk to uh, both um, Heather and Sarah, and I'll do a quick introduction for them in a moment. Um, but please, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box that's located at the bottom of your screen. So now a little bit about tonight's author and the text in question. Heather McGee is an expert in economic and social policy, the former president of the inequality-focused think tank, Demos. McGee has drafted legislation, testified before Congress, and contributed regularly to news shows, including NBC's Meet the Press. She now chairs the Board of Color of Change, the nation's largest online racial justice organization. McGee holds a BA in American Studies from Yale University and a JD from the University of California Berkeley School of Law. In the sum of us, McGee embarks on a deeply personal journey across the country from Maine to Mississippi to California, Challenging what we lose when we buy into the zero sum paradigm. The idea that progress for some of us must come at the expense of others. Along the way, she meets white people who confide in her about losing their homes, their, their dreams, and are shattered better jobs to the toxic mix of American racism and greed. This is a story of how public goods in this country from parks and pools to functioning schools have become private luxuries. Of how unions collapsed, wages stagnated and inequality increased and of how this country, unique among the world's advanced economies, has thwarted universal health care. But, unlike, but in unlikely places of worship and work, McGee finds proof of what she calls the solidarity dividend, the benefits we gain when people come together across race to accomplish what we simply can't do on our own. The Some of Us is not only a brilliant analysis of how we arrived here, but also a heartfelt message delivered with startling empathy from a Black woman to a multiracial America. It leaves us with a new vision for a future in which we finally realize that life can be more than a zero sum game. Well, I'm ready. How about you? So before we begin, and speaking of WKYC, tonight we are not only honored to have Heather McGee here with us, but also WKYC's own Sarah Shookman, who she'll be the moderator for this evening's event. Sarah is an Emmy and Moro award-winning television journalist who is glad to be working here at home in Northeast Ohio. Sarah anchors three news this front row at 7 p.m. with Jen Donovan and she joined the Three News team in 2012. So without further ado, Sarah and Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Stephen. You're welcome. Thank you, Stephen, for the great introduction. I am ready. You gave us all the excitement we were looking for. And Heather, thank you so much for spending time with us here in Northeast Ohio tonight. I'm so glad to be here. Good to see you again, Sarah. Good to see you as well. I know so many of us have been looking forward to this ever since we did our special back in January. Um, we read the book here together at WKYC. So thank you today for helping us further this conversation. It's really my honor and a privilege. So I know the audience is going to have many questions too. And as Steve said, please, as you're thinking of them, go ahead and type them in the chat box um, as we go, because he will be bringing them in later. But I feel honored to get to start tonight and get to ask some of my own questions. So let's start at the beginning, Heather, mm -hmm. with the title of your book, The Sum of Us. Where does that come from? So uh, Sarah, I spent nearly 20 years helping to build and then run a think tank that focused on policy solutions to inequality in America. And I was really lucky to have this job because I was really focused on what had happened to the American dream. Um, this was a question that I'd asked myself from early on growing up as I did on the south side of Chicago. Um, and I really began to see and notice even as a kid 
how the neighborhoods around me and the parks and playgrounds were sort of falling into disrepair while there was so much wealth on the other side of town. And as I grew up and got educated, I was really privileged to be able to um, work in an organization that was focused on studying the American economy and using research and statistical analysis to develop evidence-based policy solutions and try to get those in the hands of policymakers and business leaders, hoping that they would make better economic decisions about things like poverty work and student debt and unaffordable housing and healthcare. And for those 20 years, I felt like I was doing great work. And yet I had to admit, even after four years of running the organization, that we weren't actually making as much progress as we should. The evidence was mounting that our economy as it was currently run was being very good at creating a lot of wealth for people on the top, but it simply wasn't delivering enough security and opportunity for most families. And so I decided to quit my job and set out on a journey across the country to ask a kind of simple question, but one that had kind of evaded me, which is why does it seem like we can't have nice things in America? And by nice things, I don't mean self-driving cars and you know laundry that does itself. I mean, things like really affordable health care, um, things like universal child care and paid family leave and you know a well-funded school in every neighborhood. And, and one of the first insights that I gleaned on my journey was this whole body of research that was saying that our collective economic progress is being held back in many ways by a story. And that story is a story that tells people that the world is a zero sum game. And a zero sum game is one in which there are competing parties and when one side gets one point, the other side loses a point. So it can only ever add up to zero. And the logic of the zero sum game is like, I have one more dollar in my pocket, you must have one less dollar in your pocket. And that zero sum is a story that according to the research is racialized in the US and it's racialized because the people who see the world through that sort of zero sum lens see that it's racial and ethnic groups who are sort of competing for for status and dominance. And it's racialized in the US because interestingly, white Americans are far more likely to view the world through that zero sum prism. And it's not true that people of color tend to view the world that way, that progress for us, for example, has to come at white folks' expense. And so I was really intrigued by this story, right? This zero-sum story. And it, it ran counter to all of the evidence that economics and policy had taught me, right? It economics teaches us that, you know, it's a normal game, right? You want all your players on the field scoring points for your team. You don't want anyone sidelined due to debt, discrimination, and disadvantage. And yet the zero sum tells us that we're not all on the same team. And so it's that kind of undermining of our ability to feel like we're on the same team and kind of row in the same direction that felt to me like maybe this is one of the missing pieces in the story of of the explanation of why it is we can't have nice things for all of us. I love that idea. I I like how you uh, put it in your introduction, even like beliefs matter in the face of all of this evidence. You know, it's that story that has continued to uh, perpetuate itself. So who did you write this book for and why did Mm. you feel like it was important to get it out there? You know, it's a really good question there. Yes, very good questions. Um, You you. know, I I wrote the book for, for all of us, for the sum of us, right? For everyone who has ever asked themselves that question. Why does it seem like we can't have nice things? You know, Um, I was walking down the street in in Fort Myers, Florida, (laughs) random small city. And I was talking about something and the woman said, you know, we're supposed to be the greatest country on earth. Why is it that, you know, we have people who still go to work all day and come home in poverty? And I was just like, yeah, you know, so I wrote it for her, right? I wrote it for the people who said, it doesn't seem to make sense, right? We, we make so much money and yet 1% of the population owns more wealth than the entire middle class while half of adult workers are paid too little to meet their basic needs for things like housing and food. And I wrote it for, in terms of racially, I wrote the book for the 
Americans of color who are disproportionately uninsured and impoverished, and also for the white Americans who are the majority of the uninsured and the impoverished. I wrote it for all of us who have looked at our country and said, we should be able to tackle big things and solve big problems. Like the 80 year old conservative white man who looked me dead in the eye and said, you know, there's some truth to what you're saying because when I grew up, I knew America could do great things. We could put a man on the moon. We could cure polio. We could, we could you know, build the Hoover Dam. And I think if we had to do that today, we just wouldn't. And he was really sad about it. And so I wrote it for him too, to help explain what happened, what, what we lost in terms of that sense of collective spirit for solving big problems together. Yeah, that sense of what has changed. Tell me about the journey you went on. This um, started with economic research, but the kind of research you did for the book um, uh, involved a lot of travel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had, you know, um, worked in the, uh, in the Beltway in Washington, D.C. Uh, Demos, my organization, was headquartered in New York. I would gotten to know, you know, the Washington media and legislative staffers and members of Congress. But I felt like to really answer this question, I had to get out on the road. And I ended up talking to hundreds of people, dozens of whom stories end up in the book, uh, who were willing to share their America with me, their fears, their anxieties, their stories of their lives and the past that they took. And, And to a one, you realize that the closer you get to the details of any American's life, the more our collective choices are revealed, right? You can tell your own story in a way that is, I did this, and this happened to me, and I did this. And yet, the more people you talk to, the more you realize that there were certain doors that were open, right, or shut based on these sort of rivulets of history, based on the way in which um, politics and policy and the economy and society shapes our opportunity. And so it was through those stories, um, so many people that I'll I'll never forget, um, that I was really fortunate they were willing to share with me, um, that I really was able to piece together a more convincing story for for why we can't have nice things, and also a vision of how we can, how we can in the future together. The narrative is part of what makes this book so enjoyable to read and and really, I think, sink in for, for all of us. Um, You know, some of that time in your research was spent here in Cleveland. There are many Mm -hmm. Northeast Ohio mentions in the book, actually. And you actually have some family history here. Your mother, Dr. Gail Christopher, is originally from Cleveland. She grew up near the St. Clair and and Huff neighborhoods. Are there any stories you remember from from her childhood? Oh, you know, my mom... um... Her name is Gail Christopher, and she grew up on Gooding Street, and she used to talk about how her little group of girl, you know, girlfriends who grew up on the same street together were known as the Gooding Girls. And they kind of um, had that reputation. They were sort of goody two shoes. You know, my mom was really, really square and followed the rules. And um, she was an actress. Um, she was really involved in uh, school theater. And I found a trove recently of photographs of hers from like, high school and middle school. Um, and I'm just picturing a, a picture. If I were tech savvy, I could pull it up and share my screen or something, but I can't. Sorry. Um, of her pointing at um, uh, sort of um, like a, you know, a, a poster board on the wall with a few other students. And it was a, they were all pointing at a picture of John F. Kennedy and it said, our new president. Huh. And it was just such a like moment in time. Um, yeah. So she, she had great memories of, of growing up in Cleveland. It was a really idyllic time all black neighborhood for the most part, um, uh, mostly all black school. Um, she was born in 1950. Um, and then I grew up in Chicago myself, yeah. Yeah, so the Midwest roots run deep for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and as we said, you did visit here as part of the research for the book. I would love to ask you if you would be willing to read a passage about one of those trips here in Northeast Ohio in chapter four, Ignoring the Canary, you talk about Cleveland's Mount Pleasant neighborhood. Would you mind to share that with us? I I would love to. Um, So this chapter, chapter four, Ignoring the Canary is, is for me, it's, um, it was the toughest chapter to write. I wrote the largest number of revisions to it. 
it's the thing that um, I get the most emotional about uh, in the book um, because it's what I, it tells the story of how I spent the first decade of my career um, really on the front lines of the consumer advocacy organizations and groups that were grassroots organizations that were really trying to stop the subprime mortgage crisis from happening um, back before it was too late. And, um, you know, there are lots of reasons why I uh, feel sort of personally connected to these stories of, of Black families losing their homes and the indifference with which it was treated as a crisis before, you know, in the early parts of the 2000s. And so, um, this is just uh, a passage from sort of the middle of that chapter. I'll never forget a trip I took to the Mount Pleasant neighborhood in Cleveland, Ohio. On a leafy street, residents told me how, a few years back, house by house, each homeowner, over 90% of them Black with a few Latinx and South, and eight, South Asian immigrants, had opened an envelope, answered a knock on the door, or taken a call from someone with an offer to help consolidate their debt or lower their bills. In the ensuing years, with quiet shame and in loud public hearings, with supportive aldermen, pastors, and lawyers outmatched by the indifference of bankers and regulators with the power to help them, residents had fought to keep their homes. But by 2007, the block I was on had only two or three houses still in the hands of their rightful owners. I excused myself from the group and walked around the corner, barely getting out of their eyesight in time to fall to my knees, chest heaving. It was the weight of history, the scale of the theft, and how powerless we had proven to change any of it. These were properties that meant everything to people whose ancestors, their grandparents in some cases, had been sold as property. To this day, it's hard for me to think about it without emotion. That's why, as I looked at the Tomlins, smiling at each other on their porch more than a decade later, it was like I'd slipped into the world as it could have been, as it should have been. With the relative rarity of a lightning strike, an available and dogged lawyer, a well-timed suit in a state with good consumer protections and a particularly corrupt and inept defendant, the Tomlins had saved their home and protected more than a thousand other working and middle-class homeowners in their state. Had more black families targeted by subprime lenders in those early years found the Tomlins happy ending, history would have turned. The mortgage market would have learned its lesson about some prime mortgages earlier in the 2000s, and the worst excesses would have been checked before they spun out of control and toppled the entire economy, causing 19.2 trillion in lost household wealth and 8 million lost jobs, and that was just in the United States. The earliest predatory mortgage lending victims, disproportionately Black, were the canaries in the coal mine, but their warning went unheeded. Hmm. So powerful to, to hear you read it. And I just have to put in a quick plug. I love the audiobook version. Yeah, because Heather yeah. reads it herself. So if you haven't experienced that, if you read the physical book, I would also recommend getting on Libby or Audible and, and listening as well. Um, but to, to revisit this feeling you had there, Heather, um, why were you so overcome? And, and how hmm. is this the example of one example of many in the book where racism is costing everyone. You know, I was overcome because there is something so life-changing about whether you own a home or not. Um, we know, right, that it really is home ownership that is the the foundation of economic security and that was explicitly taken that opportunity to build that kind of wealth from black families throughout most of the 20th century by explicitly racist federal government policies across the country not at all just in the south and so you had so much conspiracy to deny black people in the, you know, before 
I was standing on that street corner in 2007, um, to deny Black people the ability to gain that piece of the American dream. And then you had just this brief window when movements had stopped redlining and created a, a momentary window of opportunity. And then an anti-government deregulatory fervor swept Washington and the rules were loosened on Wall Street and new kinds of mortgage brokers and lenders cropped up and they realized that they could get away with anything, particularly if they started in the communities that were the least protected uh, and the least respected, um, which were black communities. And there's just something so visceral about um, the shame of debt and of losing your home um, and seeing these patterns of black people gaining a piece of the American dream and then having it ripped away. Um, it reminds me of a, 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 a part of our history that I actually don't touch on a whole lot in the book, but as I'm journeying around the country again right now, we, we can maybe talk about that later, but um, I'm seeing it time and time again, where there are these communities, these black communities that were thriving, um, these sort of segregated downtowns that were mostly black businesses and institutions, banks and schools and businesses. And, um, and they were so often destroyed by federal policy to build highways. They were neighbors that were condemned because they were the least politically powerful to build the interstate highway system. Um, and it's that sort of cycle of recurring loss that is so, um, it's, just, it's just deeply painful to see. And, and the sort of gaslighting around it, right? The fact that most people don't know um, about the decimation of neighborhoods by the highways. Most people don't know that, that Black Wall Street existed in Tulsa. And then even if people know that, they usually don't know that it was rebuilt again, that Black people came back and rebuilt it. And then the highway came through in the mid 1950s and destroyed it again, right? That Greenwood neighborhood destroyed that wealth. So um, that feeling of, of being frustrated that the sort of dominant narrative would never include the right story about this injustice. Um, and that's what I really tried to counteract with telling the story of the financial crisis as I saw it, where um, it was the majority who received subprime loans were already homeowners. So it's not true that they were sort of trying to get houses they couldn't afford. They were refinancing existing loans. And the majority of people who got these subprime loans actually had good credit. And black families were three times as likely as white families to be sold these loans just because they could, they could just because the, the lenders could. Um, and then of course, with the financial crisis for me, that's just one of the many examples where racism and our politics and our policy making, both the discriminatory lending, um, which virtually all the major banks were, were fined for, um, and the sort of racist indifference and stereotypes that stopped kind of government action and, and set a media narrative that blamed the victim ended up meaning that the crisis went unchecked until it nearly toppled the global economy. So that is an example of of racism ultimately having a cost for everyone. Absolutely. Um, many of these costs, as you talk about, we all feel come from these drained pool politics. Um, talk to us about that. I know it is a, a metaphor you use, but it's also a physical reality you, you saw in many places, um, including a similar example here in the Warren area outside of Cleveland, mm -hmm. where they you know, instead privatized what was a public pool. Yeah. So this is really, um, this is the, the story that for me, other than the zero sum, it was the drained pool that was what I came across that felt like it answered, um, you know, an, a question that I had had, which is basically what happened to the whole ethos of public goods that helped define the New Deal era, that helped build the foundation of the American middle class that was reflected in things like social security and the massive investment in housing that allowed working class people to afford a home and mass home ownership, the GI Bill, free college, um, you know, roads, bridges, schools, the kinds of things that that 80 something year old man told me, you know, was just par for the course. Like, of course, this country invests in itself. Um, that's how it leads. And that 
kind of consensus really deteriorated at a point in the sort of late 1960s, early 1970s, really accelerating in the 1980s. And in, instead of the era of public goods, we now have the inequality era. Um, and I really understood how that had happened, but I didn't understand why. And the story of the public pools was really telling to me. It was a story of what happened to many of the country's nearly 2,000 lavishly funded public swimming pools. And these are really grand resort style pools that could often hold thousands of swimmers at a time. And they were part of this building boom of public goods, like public libraries and roads and bridges and schools and parks. And it was true that all of those public goods that I described, social security, the GI bill, um, they had an asterisk to them and they were often usually almost completely racially exclusionary and segregated. Social security for the elderly was uh, this wonderful New Deal public good program, but it excluded the two job categories that most black workers were in, domestic work and agricultural work in a concession, a compromise with the Southern delegation of Congress. The massive investment in housing and uh, mortgages was something that was based on the never substantiated assumption that black people would be a terrible credit risk. And so the New Deal government drew maps of the largest cities of the country and surveyed the neighborhoods and redlined, drew red lines around the neighborhoods with high concentrations of Negroes and told banks, you may not lend here. You will not get any federal support or backstop of insurance if you lend in these areas, required racial covenants of private developers to get federal loans and guarantees. And so too was the GI Bill, which was race neutral on its face, but often segregated housing and education markets were where the public benefits went through. And so, you know, this story of the public pools for me was telling because often the public pools were segregated too, that were also a part of that public good spirit. People think of things like segregated pools as sort of a, a Southern story, but it's not true, right? There might've been a, a sign on the fence in the South, but it just would have been custom enforced by intimidation and violence. Um, I was reading just the other day, a story about a, a black boy who drifted too far in Lake Michigan to the sort of white beach um, and was stoned and drowned. Um, and so, when in the wake of the Brown v. Board of Education successful lawsuit, black families began to sue their local towns and counties and say, hey, these public swimming pools are being paid for by our tax dollars too. And we, we want our kids to swim too. Many towns and cities took what was once this prized public good and rather than integrate it and share it with all of the public, they were willing to destroy it. They were willing to drain the pool, back up truckloads of dirt and seed it over with grass, literally close down the entire parks and recreation department in some instances. Um, in Warren, Ohio, they tried to um, take what was a public good and make it a sort of private club. It was the idea that they could sell the public pool to a private membership only club that could then discriminate. Um, that would then, you know, create a new membership roster that just happened to include every white person in, in the area, right? Um, and so for me, this is not just a story about an injustice about swimming. It's a story about the very idea of the public losing favor with the white public once it was an integrated public good. And you really began to see the public opinion among the majority of white Americans shift away from government solutions, away from public goods away from the sort of higher tax on the wealthy, higher investment, you know, free public goods um, kind of social contract that had created the greatest middle class the world had ever seen. And so ultimately the withdrawal of white support for public goods has cost white people just as much as the destruction of a public pool would. Um, and I, I sort of bring the metaphor of the drained public pool through to store issues like higher education uh, and workers' rights and all of these things that uh, are better when we do them together, uh, when we pool our funds, when we provide for them publicly. And we have sort of stood alone in the last 50 years of sort of walking away from that winning formula 
in some ways out of racial resentment and spite. I know you touch on this a little bit in the uh, afterword you published in the paperback uh, version that came out this February, but some of that idea of public good, um, maybe we've started to see that come back into the fore with the American Rescue Plan, with the infrastructure bill, with some of the the developments of the last few years here um, since, since you published. Broadly, what would you say what has changed politically since the book was finished? And what is the government's role or should it be in reaching some of these goals? You know, um, that's really such a great question, Sarah. And I, I was delighted to be able to write an afterward for the paperback. But the book I finished, the original book I finished um, November of 2020. So it was before uh, I knew what the election results were, but, you know, just barely. Um, it was before January 6th. It was before all of the legislation that came out in the first 100 days, before the American Rescue Plan, the child tax credit, uh, the, the major provision of vaccines in, and you know all the sort of public health measures that were reflected in the American Rescue Plan. It was also before um, the, the attacks across the country on our children's education and freedom to learn, uh, the book bans, the sort of backlash against the idea of Americans learning the full story of their own history. Um, And so much of that has been really kind of a a real-time demonstration of two of the big themes in the book. One on the negative side, the zero sum, right? Um, Whether we're talking about the big lie in January 6th, University of Chicago researchers who study political violence found that the most common worldview held by the people who attacked the Capitol on the 6th and were willing to overthrow our democracy in order to keep their vision of of who had won the election, the most um, common viewpoint was the zero sum racial story. The idea that as people of color became more numerous in the country, it would mean a loss for white people. um, you know, it's it's that story that is a sort of common sense white nationalism that's now become so pervasive in 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 cable news, and the zero sum I think is also at play with the attacks on our children's freedom to learn. The idea that it's somehow it's either you know a fuller multicultural history um, that's somehow threatening to to white history, right, as opposed to it being the idea that um, learning all of this is all of our history. So that's the bad news, but the good news is that more so than I even ever could have imagined when I was writing the book, we really have gotten a lot closer to refilling the pool of public goods for everyone coming out of the pandemic with the American Rescue Plan and other initiatives in this past year. I mean, the stimulus, the unemployment insurance, the generous unemployment insurance, the rental assistance, the, the moratorium on the foreclosures, the fact that people haven't paid a dime in student debt uh, since this administration began, all of that um, has meant what I call in the book a, a solidarity dividend, the multiracial coalition saying, you know what, we need each other. They, these are these big problems. We know we can solve them together. You know, people don't talk about this much, but the US poverty rate sunk down to or was pushed down to the lowest level that it had been on record um, last year. And that's a huge accomplishment and achievement. That means a better life for so many people. Um, And I think we should all be be very proud of that. Well, I definitely wanna talk more about solidarity dividends in a second. I hate to move back to the the bad news, but I do wanna dive into that a little bit more. You brought up um, the idea of of education. Do you feel like we've seen a lot of fear mongering here around critical race Mm. theory in Ohio, Mm -hmm. like many Mm -hmm. states have, um, has your book been called CRT? Do you (laughs) feel like your book and books like it have sparked some of this pushback? Um, that's an interesting question, Sarah. You know, um, uh, my book has not been sort of attacked yet, uh, by name or sort of, you know, I have not become... Uh, the Some of Us has not become a target like the 1619 Project or How to Be an Anti-Racist or even, uh, you know, Beloved by Toni Morrison, which is just unbelievable. Another or, you know, Northeast Ruth. Ohioan. We're proud. Thank you. Exactly. 
Um, or Ruby Bridges autobiography, you know, about a six year old girl trying to go to school. Um, so, you know, I'm sure I'm sure that it will be at some point. And I'm, I'm sure that, you know, in many of the states where um, these lists are being drawn up and these uh, these bills are being pa- considered and, and passed that say that teachers can't teach things that basically might make students feel uncomfortable about actions taken by people of their own race in the past. Um, yeah, there's, there's plenty of that in, in my book. And so um, I'm, I'm fully aware of that. Um, there's a young reader's version of the book coming out next year, which I'm really thrilled about, an adaptation for younger readers. Um, and, you know, I, I would like to think that by explicitly naming so many of the dynamics that are driving this cynical, partisan push to suppress our children's freedom to learn and to distract from what families and parents really need, which is an end to the pandemic, childcare, elder care for their aging parents, you know, free college, right? All these things that are actually really important to families of every race. Um, These attacks are trying to distract from right-wing opposition to doing anything to help parents in the day-to-day. I would like to think that the book would be a way to bring people together, to have a thoughtful conversation, to get past the fear-mongering. As I was on my journey and as I was writing the book, I tried to have really radical empathy. Uh, I wanted to make a book that people on all sides of the ideological spectrum, people of every background could see something in themselves reflected and fairly, and that could be the cause, the sort of impetus for conversation about how we have a shared interest in making this country better for everyone and that it's not a zero sum game. So my book is probably actually banned in some states but uh, I think that ultimately young people and people who are not in school are intellectually curious. They're um, wanting to understand how we got to this place. And you know they're not that trusting of people who want to keep them in the dark about things. Yeah, currently in Ohio, um, there are three bills moving through the legislature that are related to the censorship of certain topics. There's House Bill 322, House Bill 327, and the latest is House Bill 606, which is co-signing also some of the same language from Florida's much talked about don't say gay bill, um, as well as addressing how race and racism are taught in K through 12 schools. This week we had our primary here, as you know, um, and campaign ads. There were there were a, a lot. Of, there was a lot of rhetoric um, around or against, I should say, infusing diversity, equity, and inclusion into education. One thing we've noticed is we don't see a lot of ads on the other side of the debate, mm. or we don't hear much from those defending the DEI mm. in education. Is that group shrinking, or or what do you think can be done about that? You know, that's, that's so perceptive. Um, I think that there is a lot of fear. Um, there's something about the angry, violent threats that have often accompanied school board meetings and rhetoric around this um, that is frightening. I think seeing state-sponsored censorship sort of sweep the country in the land of the free Um, has really scared people. I think the penalties around um, this censorship, which include, you know, people getting fired and harassed by teachers, um, excuse me, teachers getting fired and harassed, librarians being sort of called out, um, has created a culture of of fear and intimidation. Um, And I think that it is a shame that the people on the other side of the political aisle who have voted against all of these measures almost uniformly um, have not 
spoken up more forcefully. Um, there have been real pockets of resistance. There are organizations like Red, White and Red Wine and Blue, which is sort of a moms group, uh, a sort of wine moms group that, um, that has done trainings to attack, um, to sort of counteract book bans. Um, organizations like Indivisible have gotten involved. Color of Change, my organization that I'm a uh, volunteer on the board of, has done work, but it hasn't reached the kind of fever pitch that it has on the right. And I think that's a shame. Why? Because 88% of Americans think that we should teach all of our history, the best parts and the worst parts. Um, you know, these bills are often unpopular, even though they pass from these very um, partisan state legislatures. Um, there is something about the fears about talking about race, the sense that those who are opposed to it are more violent, passionate, and committed than are those who are just open to new ideas. Um, I even think the political violence of January 6th still has a hangover of, of a feeling of, of intimidation. Um, and, and, but we can't be cowed, right? If Ruby Bridges, who's six years old, could walk through screaming crowds of adults and face death threats and have to bring her lunch every day because there was a threat that her food would be poisoned in school, um, then we can certainly speak out about our own children's freedom to learn. Let's move into the solidarity dividends again. Um, I, as I said, you know, we some of our employees here, as we read this book, we loved this concept because we saw it as a way to to move forward and to offer hope, as you've talked about. You're again traveling now. Um, what other examples have you seen since you published the book? And a little birdie uh, told me back in January you were working on maybe a podcast follow up. So, so give us this. That's right. That. All right. Thanks, Sarah. So, um, you know, this idea of the solidarity dividend is really about the gains that we can unlock when we come together across lines of race. And um, I tell stories about that in the book uh, from all over the country. But ultimately, as I was ending the book, I thought, gosh, I really want to know more about this, right? I mean, I sort of helped solve an, a, a puzzle that was in my own mind about the zero sum and the drained pool, but it was really the, the hope and the optimism that I gleaned from seeing these solidarity dividends that I felt like I needed to get back in touch with and frankly have more of because, you know, things have gotten um, darker and scarier for sure um, since I finished writing the book. And so I decided to hit the road again um, to do a podcast sort of spinoff on the book that's focused entirely on solidarity dividend stories, stories that are not in the headlines of people coming together across lines of race to address problems in their community and their neighborhoods, usually often caused at least in part by racism. And each one is a, is a story of a victory. Um, I'm, I think in eight different uh, communities across the country from rural Nevada, where a white mountain biker and an indigenous school teacher got together to help lead a movement to silence what has been the last remaining sundown siren that sounds like a like a air horn, like a war horn um, at sundown every night and has to tell the indigenous people to leave town that's still sounding in 2022 um, to a black and white community that came together in Memphis, Tennessee to stop an oil pipeline that threatened the community's uh, water, the, the aquifer, the fresh water of the city and the black neighborhood um, that would have been sort of right in the crosshairs of the pipeline. And so these stories have really given me hope. They're stories of people stepping out of their comfort zone, realizing there's not so much that divides them. Uh, I go back to Kansas City and talk to Bridget and Terrence, the fast food workers who are part of the chapter on worker organizing. And I go back to Lewiston, Maine and tell actually a slightly different story of immigrant uh, and Maine are uh, sort of solidarity around another issue of um, that's affecting small town America, which is the loss of farmland. So that podcast will be out in August or September um, from Higher Ground, which is the Obama's production company uh, on Spotify. Well, we are really looking forward to that. I see Steve has popped back in here. So I guess it's time Hi. some audience questions. 
Yeah, and Sarah, you are so good. Some of my questions I'm marking off as you're asking. I'm like, oh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it looks like we got a couple comments and then maybe two questions. So I'm going to read the comments first. Uh, I'll start with the chat. Um, this is from Bridget Emerson. Uh, I am loving this book. It's so powerful. It's informationally rich and deeply impactful, but with direct pithy phrasing that gets right to the heart of the matter. We are reading it in our church social justice book club. Thank you for writing it. Awesome. Right, nice. Bridget? Uh, then from Jeanette Vajda, uh, this information was so powerful and so eloquently written that I've been very affected by it. I have tried to share with others as I, tr as I tried to share this book, but I cannot do justice to this amazing book. Oh, thank you so much. That's amazing. And then there was a comment, uh, just a comment. This is from C. Sherpas. Uh, I read your book some time ago and found it moving, impactful, and extraordinary. It was a history I did not have. Uh, that loss of a Black neighborhood happened in Akron, Ohio, with the development of an urban expressway that is used by few today. Thank you for writing the book. Thank you. All right. All right. We got a thank you. couple of questions here. I'm going to start first with uh, this is Ely Levinson. I hope I did not butcher your name. Uh, I am a student at the University of Akron and Turning Point, a conservative Christian club, has been harassing Jewish students here. What can we do to stop this? I have, I have been personally harassed here and so have several others. Oh, it's terrible. I'm so sorry, Eli. I, um, you know, there's just, there's no excuse for anti-Semitism, for any kind of harassment and discrimination based on your identity. And um, I would hope that the university administrators would look into this issue and investigate it and that it would be in violation of some codes of behavior of the school. Um, but I also know that we've got an intrepid reporter here on the, on the, um, on the line. Um, and this is the kind of issue that certainly if it's you know, widespread um, should be getting public attention um, because there's, there's, there's a lot of, of hate and vitriol and anti-Semitism that is a part of the, um, the zero sum racial story and a part of the growing white supremacist movements in this country. And, and it has to be stamped out. I agree. Uh, I will just weigh in there and say, I'm sending you my email address. We would certainly love to talk with you further. In fact, our most recent turning point episode was just um, aired on Yom HaShoah talked about um, the idea of all the uh, anti-Semitism that we've been seeing as well. So oh, that's great. Easy. Nice. A plug for a turning point. It's it's just a wonderful series that not enough uh, local news is doing this kind of in-depth work. Thank you, Heather. Uh, from Bridget Emerson, uh, what parallels do you see between all of this, the whole interrelated web and the history of misogyny, as well as the current battle on the horizon for Roe versus Wade and women's rights? Yeah. What similarities do you see both historically and currently, if any, or do you perceive them to be fundamentally different? Not at all fundamentally different, different at all. Um, I am, um, where to start? So um, there is a book that uh, a friend of mine wrote called L The Lies That Bind, um, Elise Hogue. Um, it is a history of the rise of the religious right. And it tells you some shocking things that most people don't know, certainly I didn't know. For example, that when Roe v. Wade uh, passed or when Roe v. Wade uh, came down, the decision, most of the organized religions were open to abortion, thought it was something that it was a decision between a clergy and a woman and her doctor. Um, in fact, the sort of network of people who would make sure abortions could happen um, before Roe were clergy. Um, in fact, I'm in Dallas right now um, doing a podcast episode about that history and about what's going on right now to revive that network to get women from Texas to New Mexico. Um, and, and so the idea that sort of organized religion would be against this practice um, is, is a relatively new one. And it actually happened almost a decade after Roe v. Wade as people in the religious right who were conservative around racial issues uh, and around school desegregation uh, became sort of, um, you know, they, they lost the momentum on that issue. 
as you know, public opinion moved away from being you know, vehemently opposed to school desegregation. And they were looking for another issue that would sort of you know, bring churches into politics. And that ended up being the one. Now, the history is very similar. Um, or there's sort of like, you know, sort of movement ties in the history between uh, the history of sort of organized racism and the history of, um, of the organized opposition to abortion and the sort of conservative infrastructure. But also, if you think about it, I really do see it as a zero sum lie, as a solidarity dividend in the making is what Roe v. Wade was, because Roe v. Wade's impact um, was not so significant on motherhood and childbearing and all of that because people were having abortions before Roe v. Wade at great cost um, and great danger. Um, but the biggest impact of Roe v. Wade was to the to women's economic participation and to women's ability to control their reproductive lives so that they could, you know, contribute all that they could in society and have children at the right time and place. And um, you know, so co women's college completion shot up nearly doubled after Roe v. Wade, uh, women's workforce participation. We now have the majority of people who are in higher education are women. And so when we think about what the costs will be of um, allowing a fringe idea, the idea that Roe v. Wade should be overturned is uh, supported by just 29% of the country, 70% of the country thinks it needs to stay as it is. If we allow this fringe idea to become the law of the land, it is a threat to our entire economy, to families across the country. Um, and I really do think that we've got to have a strong multiracial, multi-class coalition that says that A, democracy should function well, right? And if such a vital, important issue is supported by 70% of the population, uh, then a political minority should not be able to impose its vision on the rest of the country. Um, and that fundamentally it is a human right to be able to control your body and the most important decision you make in your life, which is when and whether and how to have a family. Okay. There's another comment, I believe, uh, this is from Gigi Elder. Uh, she says, I have facilitated two book clubs using this text. Oh, go Please Gigi. create one for students in middle school. I am. I am. We are. Gigi, that's so wonderful. Thank you for facilitating book clubs about the book. That's so fabulous. Um, so the Young Readers Edition is coming out um, next January. It's just taking a minute, you know, publishing, supply chain, it's the whole thing, um, from Random House Children's. And it is aimed at middle school. And there will be a discussion guide that's for middle schoolers. So... Um, hang tight and thank you so very much. All right. Okay, so it looks like that's the end of the Q&A uh, for um, our viewers. But again, put them in the Q&A box if you have more. I've got a couple questions. I'm trying to see what's left. Sarah had some great ones that, I don't know, great minds think alike. Maybe I should think about getting on the news. Probably not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's see. Uh, let me Let me throw this one. Um, there were so many different aspects of this book that I loved, uh, but I especially enjoyed the genuine and organic conversations that developed from your journey across the country. Mm. Those hard, brutal, yet honest conversations that define the human condition. It appears that out of those conversations, the narrative was born that details how societal racism negatively, negatively affects those that were supposed to benefit from its privilege. Can you mm -hmm. speak more on that aspect? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was, it was really important to me to make this case that racism has a cost for everyone, that ultimately it's a fiction that we are so separated and divided. Um, and I'm not by any means saying that racism is not worse uh, for the targeted communities, obviously. And I'm not denying the existence of privileges based on being uh, a person with white skin and, and born into families that have been, you know, given real economic privileges over the generations in this country um, by law and by custom. But I am saying that ultimately it's not a zero sum. 
progress for people of color doesn't come at the expense of white folks. And I really have that driven home to me as I talk to, you know, white workers in Mississippi who wanted desperately to have the kind of economic security that a good union job created for other auto factory workers in, you know, the Midwest, but weren't able to because of the sort of racist anti-union associations that happen in many places in the American South. Uh, the spirit, as one worker told me, where white workers felt like, if the blacks are for it, I'm against it. Um, and the sense that anything that would be a collective action that would be collective across lines of race was um, sort of a blow to their sense of being a little bit better than. Um, who's hurt by that? Yes, obviously black workers, but white workers too. Um, I also, you know, found those stories in, in people like Larry Hogan in Ohio, um, uh, who uh, was the lead plaintiff in a lawsuit that Demos took all the way to the Supreme Court uh, against the voter purges, right? All of these um, voter suppression measures that oftentimes are really directed at voters of color uh, for partisan reasons, but sweep in white voters as well. And so our democracy as a whole is more um, uh, fractious and insecure and unrepresentative, um, oftentimes because of systems and policies and structures that were set up to disenfranchise mainly black people through our history. Um, two quick comments as we're getting close to close here uh, from Mally Glazer. Thank you, Heather, for your excellent book, Your Profound Truths. We are in this together. Um, and Donna Ruther, who says, thank you for this conversation. I have the book and we'll be reading it soon. Okay. Um, so as we're getting closer, there's a couple more things I want to ask you, but I won't be greedy and hog any more of time. Uh, I know I have one more question too. Oh, I'd please, love go ahead, sir. to get in. Are you sure? No, no. I don't yeah, want to interrupt. No. Um, I just, I love to end on a positive note. Like, why? Well, first, I want to say Happy Mother's Day to you, Heather. Oh, um, thank you. And I obviously, being a mother, I'm sure has influenced your world, worldview. And we already talked about your mom and all the impressive things she has done as a change agent um, herself in some ways. I just want to say, you know, it seems like the current events and awareness is just kind of all converging to make this a time maybe more imperative than others to stand up for these ideas. What is something people can do today or this mm. week toward solidarity? Oh, that's a great question, Sarah. Um, uh, well, uh, thank you for reminding me uh, about Mother's Day in context of this question, because <laughs> I did not forget about Mother's Day, don't you worry. Um, flowers are already on their way to my mom. Um, um, so every year, um, Color Change and other organizations do something called the um, Black Mamas Bailout, which helps bail out incarcerated mothers, mothers who are sitting in jail waiting uh, sort of pretrial, um, who simply can't afford the cash bail to get out, um, who are nonviolent offenders. And um, it, it's a beautiful thing. And so uh, little things like that think, like, hey, you know, a mom being able to be with her child on Mother's Day and come home um, and if you could be a part of that, that's something that is like, a, you know, it's an annual thing on Mother's Day. Um, you know, but I think also we have to speak out for the very idea of white, black and brown mothers being able to make decisions about their lives, being able to afford to feed their children, all the children that they have, being able to know that they can look forward to a future where the planet will be habitable and hospitable <laughs> to human life. These are the kinds of things that are really what we all hold in common, um, no matter what our ethnic background or our origin, we all need these basic things in order for our families to thrive. And so speaking out for that vision, 
speaking back, speaking up against the attacks on that vision and on our children's freedom to learn and our family's freedom to thrive with reproductive health and dignity and speaking up for the clean air and water that we all need um, is a great way to uh, take an act of solidarity um, this week. Find a neighbor, commit to doing it, um, commit to registering to vote, commit to voting in your school board elections and the dog catcher and all the different parts of uh, our democracy that we still have an opportunity to have a voice in. Well, thank you. Solidarity, right? Uh, you know, I always think in my head, uh, a, a place, and I, and I heard this from someone and I, I cannot remember, but um, it's so in tune with what you were saying. It, it was kind of, getting to a point where isms become wasms, um, <laughs> which I always thought was such a great, uh, and I, I, I apologize, I can't remember who said it, um, at a place Happens where statements time. like your attitude and your aptitude, I know there's a slight thing, determine your altitude, where, the, where those are actually true. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, our time is done and we've come to an end of this segment. Uh, I really like to thank Heather, Sarah, uh, the team here at CCPL, and of Absolutely. course, all of you for joining us tonight. Before I go, and with your permission, Heather, I'd like to end with a quote from your book that really resonated. And it was, the sum of us can accomplish far more than just some of us. That's a great quote. I love it. <laughs> I don't want a t-shirt. Where's that around? <laughs> so no, thank you, everyone. Um, great conversation, Sarah, Heather. You know, um, uh, one of my ending questions was, what can we expect from you next? Um, you, you've gotten us, you know, we're salivating, we're waiting on that next morsel, um, and a podcast is coming. And Podcast and in October. We're excited. Young readers September edition. even, maybe, yes. Oh, September even, maybe? Yeah. Young readers edition come January. Lots to look forward to. And I would encourage everyone, if you don't follow Heather on social media, because she is active there. I love reading your book recommendations that you share and things like that. Um, it's so just feels like we get to know you a little bit better there as well. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks to the entire uh, Cuyahoga County Public Library and to WKYC. This has been really great. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.